welcome to this debate, Prosperity Without Growth, a Contradiction in Terms. This is a debate that's been going on for many years, and Tim and Daniel have been on either side of this debate for 20 years apiece. Uh, so we're very lucky to have them both here today. Um, Kenneth Galbraith was seen as uh, a, a bit of a maverick back in 1958 when he published his uh, work, The Affluent Society which I think is quite pertinent to the debate today. Uh, Kenneth Galbraith, obviously the uh, Canadian-American economist, his main point was America is very rich now. Now the problems of affluence have, should have been solved. The question for America should be how to best use that wealth for, to, live, to find the good life, rather than growth itself <laughs> being so central to uh, public policy at the time. Today, that's much more of a mainstream opinion, and it's what we want to debate today. But interestingly for me, it poses the question of whether this challenge to the centrality of growth comes from a disillusionment with progress, a disillusionment with the rat race, as it were, or whether it comes from a position of strength and a position of the experience of real affluence in the world. Now we are rich, we have different questions that we can answer. For me and for my generation, the average income per person in this country just over my lifetime has increased sixfold, six times. That's not in money terms, that's in real terms, you know, what you can buy with your money. We're six times richer today than we were when I was born. And our children will probably be six times richer than we are today. So the questions that our panellists are going to hopefully answer in a second, is that a good thing? Is it desirable? Is it necessary to be that much richer in a generation? Uh, is it even sustainable? So, to move to our panellists, on my left here we have Daniel Benamy, finance and economics journalist with over 20 years' experience, as we said before. He's the author of a book called Ferraris for All in Defense of Economic Progress and also Cowardly Capitalism. Yeah. On my right here we have Tim Jackson, who's Professor of Sustainable Development at the University of Surrey. He's the Economics Commissioner, the UK Sustainable Development Commission, and he's the author of Prosperity Without Growth, Economics for a Finite Planet. So with no further ado, I'll kick off to Daniel. Well, the, the first time I came across Tim in person was at a meeting at the RSA uh, in London with a similar format to, to this. He was on the panel, I was in the audience, and I stood up and spoke. And after I'd spoken, he said in front of the audience that he thought I was absolutely bonkers. And you can, you can go back in the RSA archives and uh, listen to it if you want. And I, I don't mind. I've been called lots of far, far worse things than that. I, I won't go into them now. But what he said afterwards was uh, more interesting because he said, well, I do agree with you that growth can be really, really beneficial. The problem is that the world is finite, you know, that we only have one planet. So that's what I want to focus on in my introduction. I'm not going to talk about the benefits of growth, although I do think there are huge benefits to growth now and in the future. I'm just going to focus, because I've only got 10 minutes, I'm just going to focus on the argument about there only being one planet and that the world is finite. Uh, I can count up to one, by the way. I do know uh, how many Earths there are. But I'm going to argue that although, of course, we do face challenges, uh, we do face problems, including environmental problems, I don't think we face insurmountable limits in the way that Tim and other Malthusians, I would characterize them as, uh, talk about it. So to go straight into it, I mean, the most common form, certainly until recently, of the argument about limits was that we have scarce resources. And just to keep it simple, let's just talk about oil. Because oil, unlike some resources like water or copper, you can't recycle. Obviously, some commodities you can recycle, so you can, in principle, indefinitely recycle them. But once you uh, burn oil to create energy, you can't recycle it. So is, does that mean there's an insurmountable limit in terms of the energy that we have in the world, which is one of the most common forms of the argument? I would say no for several reasons. I mean, first of all, we can use uh, oil more efficiently. So for one barrel of oil, we can I don't know the exact figures, but instead of lighting one home, we can light two homes for the same barrel of oil because we can use it more efficiently. Or instead of producing 100 pounds of goods, we can produce 200 pounds of goods. Uh, so even with existing reserves, we can use more efficiently. And in fact, I think I'm sure Tim would agree on this particular point. Although there is something called the Jevons paradox here, which means that 
when you use energy more efficiently, you tend to use more energy. So if, even if you think about your own homes, Britain, for example, is much more energy efficient than it was back in the 1970s, but we still use more energy. So you can think about things you, you have now, or to do with prosperity, that you might not have had in the 1970s, such as dishwashers and TVs and computers and so on. So energy efficiency, you know, in principle, is not a, is not a bad thing, but it doesn't provide a, a solution to the problem of energy as a scarce resource. But what you can do, of course, another thing you can do, is you can find more resources of the same, the same kind of resource. So with oil, for example, you can find more oil. So people for over 100 years now really have used this peak oil argument, that oil is about to run out and, uh, you know, soon we won't have enough energy. And their predictions keep on being confounded because uh, we go and we find new oil fields, we drill under the sea, even existing oil fields, we can extract more oil from existing oil fields with improved technology. And there are lots of other technologies which we've really hardly even started to use, like uh, we can extract oil from tar sands, we can convert uh, coal into oil, that technology already exists. As people acknowledge, these are huge potential resources, are hundreds of years' worth of resources in relation to coal. So I'm pretty confident that we could, if there were no other factors involved, we could keep going for hundreds and hundreds of years with enough oil to keep us going. I don't think that would be a problem. At some point, of course, we, we will, or we could potentially run out of oil. But I don't see that as a problem in relation to there being some kind of insurmountable energy shortage because we can use other forms of energy. We can use nuclear energy, uh, and there are lots of improved forms of nuclear energy that uh, we can use. We can use hydroelectric power. We can use solar power, which for all practical purposes is infinite. In the future, we might crack the problem of nuclear fusion. So, again, I don't really see any problem in terms of energy or other commodities as well as a scarce resource. I just, a scarce resource. Uh, that just doesn't, I'm not, not convinced by that at all. Of course, the most common form of the argument now in terms of environmental limits is not so much in terms of scarce resources. It's more in terms of what environmentalists call sinks. Uh, so really, this is about climate change. So in other words, we're pumping loads and loads of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, that's raising the uh, temperature of the planet. As a result, sea levels will rise. We'll have huge problems. So that's the, the most common and probably the most powerful form of the argument about limits nowadays. But I would say, yeah, I mean, that presents a challenge, but not a limit. It's not an insurmountable limit that we can't overcome because there are lots of ways that you can, uh, you can tackle that. One way to do that is to decarbonize the energy supply. So there are lots of forms of energy we can use, some of which I've already referred to, uh, which don't emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So uh, nuclear energy, solar power hydroelectric, and so on. Uh, so, you know, that's one thing we can do. Uh, obviously, that, that demands investment, that demands resources. Uh, we have to build the things, but, you know, that can be done uh, as well. It's not at all uh, an insurmountable problem. Another thing that we can do is to adapt. So the most common example there is to build uh, high sea walls to protect us against rising sea levels. So low-lying areas like Florida in the United States or like the Netherlands, uh, a lot of their land area is under, under the sea or under sea level, but they're not flooded because they have modern sea defences. So that's another way of dealing with the problem. And there are also more high-tech ways of dealing with the problem, what is sometimes called geoengineering, which in the future could be another form of solution. So, you know, I won't go into all the different ways now, and some of them are kind of more science fiction and wacky sounding than others, but some of them, I think, do have potential. I mean, for example, there's a uh, German professor in uh, Columbia University in New York who's working on artificial trees which can suck carbon dioxide directly out of the atmosphere, and they can do it at a thousand times the uh, rate of, of ordinary trees. So rather than just trying to uh, mitigate emissions you can directly tackle the problem by sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now, 
I don't know which of the technologies will work best of all the technologies I've mentioned, or I don't have a plan for exactly how you uh, in, invest in all of these things. But in principle, I'm sure, I'm sure it can be done. The, the problem is it demands more growth and more resources, not restraint, in order to do it. The alternative approach, which is the approach favoured by Tim, is all about so-called sustainable lifestyle and uh, sustainable consumption, sustainable living. Uh, we, I would prefer to call it rationing, call it by its real name. And it's all about focusing on individual behaviour, just making individuals consume uh, less, not to have their TV on standby, not to keep the tap running when they're brushing their teeth, to drive less and so on. And that approach, I would absolutely argue, of course, that approach won't work. That's really the approach that's been tried for 20 years. It hasn't worked in the past because people want to grow, they need more energy. Uh, that approach won't work, uh, or at least the only way it will work is through a huge amount of uh, coercion where you force people to uh, consume less. That approach won't work, that approach which is all to do with economic restraint. But an approach based on economic growth and technology and engineering, I think, will work. The tragedy is that the approach based on social pessimism that uh, Tim is putting forward, which is saying limit your ambitions, limit your horizons, that undermines our capacity to, fa to face the challenges that we have. And I would say that's not only absolutely bonkers, it's absolutely tragic. Thank you, Daniel. Tim. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me clear up this thing at the RSA, because, and you can go back and look at the visual record. I think I used the word nutter, not bonkers. Um, but, uh, but actually, what I said was, and it was very precise, it was when I first came across Daniel's work, which was a blog, um, rather a rabid blog responding to my prosperity without growth, I thought that he was a nutter. But actually, when I listened to him in person, I was pleasantly surprised, actually, <laughs> at the fact that he's not. He is a, a very carefully uh, thought-out, very motivated, very socially conscious person with some very clear ideas. And if you want any evidence of that, go and buy his book. There you go, Daniel. There's my act of <laughs> sheer, unadulterated altruism um, for you. It's the only one you're going to get today. My point, my point is that uh, actually we should be really clear what we're arguing about here. And for, I mean, I think neither of us really have any interest at all in arguing about the need, the desperate need for development. And that does mean, in some cases, economic growth in the poorest nations of the world. There's two billion people living on less than $2 a day, chronically undernourished, and growth in those places makes enormous differences, measurable differences in terms of human well-being, in terms of life expectancy, in terms of participation in education, in terms of infant mortality, in terms just actually of happiness. Sub-Saharan Africa is living in a kind of nightmare land where life expectancy is less than 40. So let's not kid ourselves that this is an argument about stopping poor people growing. It absolutely isn't. And the second thing perhaps to head off at the pass is whether this is an argument about the benefits that growth has brought us. Let's, just for the sake of argument, accept that growth brought us enormous benefits. Amongst them, the increase of life expectancy to 80 nearly in our country and countries like ours. Let's accept that there are many, many technologies that have done fantastic things to improve our lives. I mean, we can all probably find individual examples of those and individual examples of technologies which aren't so good. My two, just for the sake of illustration, on the plus side, I would look, point quite clearly, for very personal reasons, to uh, the, the technology that allows us heart and lung bypass in surgery and allows us to do amazing things to recover broken human bodies as a result. And on the negative side, I think my favorite example is the communal garden leaf blower. And uh, if any of you have not had the, the luxury, the pleasure, of coming across the leaf blower, you should definitely go out and get this experience, either as a listener to it or possibly even as an operator of it. This is a piece of diabolical equipment that sits on the back of otherwise able young men and women sent out with fossil fuels stacked close to their rear end uh, to feed a vacuum device which blows air 
into the environment with the slightly misguided purpose of clearing up leaves. And the most extraordinary thing about the leaf blower, apart from the fact that it uses fossil fuels profligately, apart from the fact that it deafens those who are using it and those who are trying to walk along the streets alongside, the most amazing thing about the leaf blower is that as the leaf blower blows the leaves in one direction, the wind <laughs> obstinately insists on blowing them back again. It's the most unproductive, useless use of fossil fuels, of technology, and of people's creativity that ever existed. But that's all beside the point. We did some good things, we did some really stupid things. The question at hand is, can we realistically expect, hope for, and achieve a kind of meaningful prosperity? Prosperity at the end of the day really only means doing well. It's about hope. The roots of the word prosperity are about hope in accordance with our hopes and expectations. And hope itself clearly matters. Hope for the future matters. But can we expect to maintain that hope if we use up fossil resources profligately, if we use up metallic and mineral reserves unguardedly? if we pollute our streams, degrade our soils, and make our climate unstable, if we cut down our forests, if we tear up our topsoils, if our fossil groundwater is used faster than it's replenished, can we seriously expect a world of nine billion Ferraris? Um, just in case you don't know, the average uh, straight road miles per gallon of a Ferrari is something under 10 miles per gallon. So if everybody in the country had a Ferrari, then in fact we would practically double our carbon emissions in this country si simply from that one single exercise. Across the world with 9 billion people do it, we simply wouldn't have the resources, even with this apparent wealth that is supposed to exist in oil shales, a deeply dirty technology with very, very high inefficiencies in getting the oil to a useful stage, even with the most optimistic scenarios for available resources of one kind and another, nine billion Ferraris just does not compute. And so what is it that, that distinguishes Daniel and I in this debate? Is it a belief that we can do things more efficiently, that he has and that I don't have? No, I've looked at the numbers. I've put the graphs in my book. We did things more efficiently, but we did masses more of them. And scale always outweighed efficiency over and over and over again. We didn't achieve any reductions in fossil fuel use. We didn't achieve any reductions in carbon emissions. We didn't achieve any reductions in the use of metallic resources. We didn't achieve any reductions in mineral exploitation. We didn't achieve any reductions in deforest in the rate of deforestation. Our species loss, the rate at which we're losing our fellow species on the planet, is around 50 to 100 times higher than pre-industrial levels, and at least 10 times higher than any biodiversity expert anywhere thinks might be regarded as a safe place for humanity to be. Safe. Leave aside whether there is a moral argument or a moral responsibility for other species on the planet. It is simply actually a prudential argument about our own ability to continue to live and to continue to aspire. And perhaps there are technologies that will do a lot better job than we've done in the past. I think we should hang on to that. So that isn't what distinguishes Daniel and I either. I think what distinguishes us at the end of the day is a sense of what it means to be human, in fact, what it means to be creative. What human, his version of my vision is of social pessimism, that's what he called it, but I'm not socially pessimistic. Actually, I'm socially optimistic. And his argument about what I should what we should, as human beings, aim to achieve in terms of technological progress, he sees as 
Ferraris. He sees it as a high-tech vision. And my only concern with that, I would love a Ferrari. Of course I would. You would love a Ferrari. Nine billion people across the world would love a Ferrari. But it simply wouldn't be enough. And this is another of the really key things, the key points to make. It wouldn't stop with Ferraris, Daniel. It would go on. The point about the Ferrari is not that it travels actually probably quite slowly with nine billion more of them out there doing the same job, but that actually it distinguishes you from other people. So while we're busy distinguishing ourselves with all of this material stuff from other people, there's no stopping us. And so my vision is not about social pessimism. It's not about a lack of creativity. It is about a recognition actually of what it means to be human and prosperity, hope in its most fundamental st- terms is not about stuff. It is about our friends, it's about our families, it's about trust in our community, it's about our sense of participation in the life of society, it's about a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives and these are the things actually that we need to reclaim from an economic system that is running itself towards destruction. Prosperity without growth is not a utopian dream, it is a financial and ecological necessity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just turn to you first, Tim? Um, The question I'd like to ask is just to see if you can bring out a little bit more about your discussion of meaning and purpose, because it seems to me that there's, there's a coincidence in your argument between the environmental catastrophe that you describe, if we continue on the road that we're on, a co- coincidence between that and your idea of the better life and the good life, which, is it just a co- happy coincidence for your argument, or, or are there two different things here? You mean, it would be, it would be, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could give up all this stuff because it would actually make us better? Is that a happy coincidence, or is it true? I think, I think it has, actually, elements of... I suppose it depends whether you believe in intelligent design or not, um, or whether you see, rather, that there is a malevolent God who has injected us at birth with an appetite for Ferraris that will inevitably drive us towards destruction or whether actually he, she or it has equipped us with the aspirations to be better as human beings, to be more rather than to have more, to respect the boundaries of others, to build ourselves out of the relationship with other people. Uh, And actually I think when you begin to look at the evidence you find that the latter is more the case, that psychology actually gives us a basis for individual identity, for personality, for aspiration, for human motivation that just isn't purely about the desire for stuff. It isn't an instinct for acquisition. It is rather a much more complex place where we're torn. Of course we have some kinds of aspirations, but most of our aspirations are to live a decent life and to have a good standing with our peers, to have strong social relations. And these things don't, in their essence, require materials. What do you think about that, Daniel? Can we have the good life without Ferraris? Uh, No. (laughs) If you want a longer answer. I mean, if you look at it historically, uh, I mean, I would see Tim as a Malthusian, and I don't use that term as a term of abuse. Uh, I mean, I use it in a very specific sense that to me the essence of Malthusianism is to, this is the idea of limits, that humans have to bow down to uh, natural limits. Uh, and if you look at Malthus's uh, essay on population, which was first published in 1798, it was explicitly to counter the optimism of the Enlightenment, because the, Enli- the Enlightenment people uh, were saying, you know, we believe in reason, uh, we believe in humanity, Uh, We believe that humans can overcome limits. In fact, that idea dates back to the Renaissance of uh, taking control of nature. Uh, It's not even an Enlightenment idea. It's a pre-Enlightenment idea, although it's the the basis for modernity. So if you look at it historically, uh, I would say that I'm very much coming from the humanist tradition and uh, Tim is coming from an anti-humanist tradition despite the fact he's using all of this humanist rhetoric. Uh, And for me... The, the thing is, what, what I'm really arguing is not that prosperity is everything. I'm arguing that prosperity is the precondition for the good life. That once we have prosperity, true prosperity, which means everyone in the world has the best that uh, humanity has to offer, then we can really fully realize our humanity. That's the point. That once we don't need to worry about 
going and working for a living for long hours with a terrible boss and scrimping and saving to get by. Once we've met that precondition of prosperity, then we can realize our full humanity, which is why I would argue my position is essentially the, the, the real humanist position, and Tim's is anti-humanist. Do you want to come in on that, Tim? Um, well, we can argue about who's the most humanist of us. That would be really entertaining, but probably not terribly productive. I mean, I agree, I would accept that Malthus, actually, in his original arguments, was wrong, even though in his identification of some material limits, he may have been closer to the mark than you'd want to suggest. I think, you know, for, for me, I guess, what, what is it? What is it that makes you so sure, Daniel, that to be fully human is to have a Ferrari? I mean, I know it's, I know it's an illustrative example, but what is it that makes you so sure that actually it's technological advance that we have to have before we can be human beings? And, and how would you answer, for example, um, an African philosopher who came to me after Prosperity Without Growth was published saying, actually, your ideas of a prosperity, your ideas of a prosperity that is shared, that is, belongs to social relationships with people rather than things, is the very heart of traditional African philosophy. It isn't something that we get only after we've got all the material stuff of the good life. It is actually at our hearts. It is what makes us human beings. Uh, I don't know about African philosophers. I do, uh, where I work, there is a Ghanaian cleaner who, has, who work, walks around with a Ferrari, uh, probably presumably not very well paid, but he has a Ferrari symbol uh, on his uh, jacket. And I asked him about it, and he wants a Ferrari. Uh, and he, in his case, he means it him, literally, he wants a Ferrari. And I'm sure of the hundreds of millions, almost a billion people now in Africa, I'm sure they do have that aspiration to have a better life. But the really important point here is there's a real sleight of hand in the whole development discussion, which Tim is also guilty of. Because the development discussion nowadays uses all these humanist-sounding concepts like human development and uh, development as freedom and so on. But when you push them... They don't believe, they've given up on the idea of economic transformation. In other words, they've given up on the idea that the third world should be as rich as the West. They don't think it's possible, and they don't think it's desirable. So although people like Amartya Sen, who's very much influenced what Tim says, is a real expert at using this humanist rhetoric, the consequence of his outlook, which is official UN policy and World Bank policy, is to say, leave people in the third world more or less living in, po in poverty. Yes, give them a little bit of growth, but essentially they need to live in poverty. And they should just concern themselves with things like their self-esteem and a bit of participation in society. And what they end up doing is they redefine development to make it much more about interpersonal relations and to make it therapeutic to be about self-esteem. So the big, I mean, if you look at the big American development discussion at the moment, it's really about women, and it's really about how third world men abuse third world women. So rather than having a real discussion about economic transformation and seeing that is the real basis for development, the whole discussion is turned around in this weird humanistic rhetoric to, to really accept people's poverty in the third world. Okay. Um, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Economic transformation has to be at the heart of any meaningful prosperity. Absolutely everywhere. And nobody in this debate has given up on the third world, on developing countries. It isn't the third world that needs therapy. It's the first world. So and we need it fast. So do you accept the third world should be as rich as the West? Would you think that is desir desirable? I think the third world has equal rights to the access to material goods, to a high standard of living, to a decent quality of life, to health, to education, to longevity, just not necessarily to Ferraris. But should it be as rich as the West? You're not answering the question. Should it be as rich as the West? Yes, absolutely. But how rich is that? That is the question in front of us. It's not should everyone have equal access to the same standard of living, even the same income. It is what is that level of income and have we already surpassed it? Okay. I'm going to come out into the audience in just a moment. I just wanted to ask Daniel one more question before we come out. So everyone get your questions ready. In your introduction, Daniel, you tackle a lot of the points that Tim makes about environmental problems by talking mm. about potential technical <coughs> solutions yeah. or technological solutions to this. But these solutions are all potential. 
isn't that a dangerous situation to put yourself in to say, potentially we can solve these problems? Maybe, maybe that wouldn't happen. Yeah, well, the, the future, if you're talking about the future, it is always a potential. I mean, we could screw up, although I think if we adopt Tim's outlook, then that increases the probability that we'll screw up. I mean, I think the mistake Tim makes is that he just extrapolates from the present into the future in a very kind of crude way. So he'll say, Ferraris, you can only get a certain amount of miles per gallon. If everyone has a Ferrari, then we'll, be, we'll run out of oil very, very quickly. But who knows what could happen? We could have electric Ferraris. We could have hydrogen fuel cell Ferraris. There's all sorts of things we can do. We shouldn't make the mistake of just crudely drawing a straight line into the future because technologies change, things develop. Uh, that's really my point. Okay, Tim, and uh, then... Yeah, I, I, I'm still not sure that we got to the heart of the difference between Daniel and I. I hope we get there by the end, but it's not, again, about um, improvements or likely improvements in efficiency in the future. I, there's a very detailed exercise in my book which makes no linear assumptions about progression into the future at all. It simply asks the question, how clever would we need to be? How much technology would we need to get the kind of future that Daniel talks about, but within the resource constraints and environmental constraints that we face. And what it turns out is that you have to have completely heroic beliefs about our own cleverness. You have to have almost a sense of magical realism, that we can forego the second law of thermodynamics, we can ignore resource scarcity, and we can simply, through our own technical cleverness, get to this magical world. And it's that, I think, that's the point, not at any other point about human creativity, but just that point of magical realism in the belief of technology where I think we're distinguished. I, I don't think there's been enough discussion about growth for whom, growth for what, and it comes down to distribution, and I don't think that's really been addressed in the panel. And uh, we saw at the height of the, of the financial crisis, obviously the world came together uh, in terms of uh, taking certain decisions which prevented a total financial collapse. But since then, we've seen a total fragmentation of international efforts. Uh, we've seen the Doha round completely stark in terms of trade and so on. And it, it, you know, the most wealthy country, let's make this final point, the most wealthy country in the world is the United States, also the most unequal. Most of us are regarded, even after healthcare reform, as having an utterly you know, primitive healthcare system. And we see inequalities and distortions with our own society, uh, with, as Adair Turner says, the city doing a lot of things that are not socially useful, and Wayne Rooney managed to extract you know, a huge salary and complete distortions in terms of who is contributing the most valuable work to our society, is it doctors, nurses, footballers, or celebrities like Jordan? Yes, I just had a question for Daniel, which is if he thought there was a level of consumption where the utility derived from that consumption is actually negative, in the saying that too much of one thing can be bad for you. So what it seems to me is that infinite economic growth is great, and in the future we can achieve this and all increase living standards, but I just wanted to know if you think there was a point at a certain point where consumption, excess consumption, would actually decrease rather than increase utility. I think Daniel's been a little bit unfair on Tim. I, I think Tim, you know, I, I, reading your book, you did say uh, you have come up with some uh, attempts at ec positive economic production. And uh, you, uh, unlike many of your sort of peers and, and fellow commentators, and you refer to the need for a Cinderella economy, which is a, quite a uh, startling image uh, that we because we need to know the uh, ecological bounds to human activity so you do want to sort of you do want to sort of shackle human ingenuity I know you say you've got to have tremendous belief in humanity to see these positive positives coming out but you, you are accepting that constraint right from the beginning you you say that we ha have to have we have to provide for decent livelihoods I agree why shouldn't we have infinite decent livelihoods, and livelihoods for all. But then you say low material and energy throughput. I'm really worried about that one because who has the low material life and who has the low energy th throughput? And okay. in your Cinderella economy, who will go to the ball and who won't? Um, Tim, what I'd like to ask is why do you just see us as consumers? The point about human beings is that we're also creators of, you know, and we can bring about more, res we're resourceful, we can resolve problems. So if it is the case that we're pushing out more carbon dioxide onto the environment, then I'd see that there is potential amongst us to be able to resolve that problem. 
If you look back 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, human beings were, you know, we had two world wars, we were threatened with nuclear war, we had a cold war, but because of the optimism that was present in sense of, in our potential to be able to resolve and respond, we are here today, and as you rightly point out, we're living longer, healthier lives. So what's the problem in having, in trusting ourselves to be able to do more? Okay, thank you. Uh, Tim, I was wondering for the people who haven't read your book, if you could maybe explain what a Cinderella economy is, or leave it for them to read. I think I'll leave it for them to read. That, that would increase sales, wouldn't it? And that would be a good thing because it would contribute to growth. Or I could share some knowledge with you and some of my own thoughts, um, which of course are free um, and enormously creative. On the question of distribution sharing, is it about distribution and sharing? Yes, it absolutely fundamentally is. Um, the Cinderella economy as an idea is the suggestion that actually there are, actually it's, it's quite a difficult thing to explain the full uh, length of my argument through it, but it is basically that there are already productive activities. There is already a sector which is doing very much what we might need an economic sector to do if it is to do those tasks that I have identified, which is to improve flourishing. And in answer to your question, I think it's just really that we don't necessarily mean that more stuff means more flourishing. We actually con consciously concentrate on what matters in terms of human flourishing. Uh, but we need it to do that in a way that doesn't continually suck material and energy resources through the system. Because it is that, it's that feature of the way that we've organized society that makes it almost impossible to achieve prosperity within the growth-based dynamic. It's not a simple thing of saying, let's do things more efficiently, but keep it as it is. There's a system dynamic that is undermining our best efforts. The Cinderella economy is the idea of enterprise organized in a different way. Instead of the pursuit of private interest, enterprise is organized around the common good, around the good of the community, around social participation, around sharing, around a different sense of what prosperity means. And the point is that these kinds of enterprises, social enterprises, enterprises with social and ecological good written into their constitution at their heart, are the places for a transformation. But at the moment, they're virtually ignored by mainstream economics. That's the sense in which they are Cinderella's. Bringing those places into the mainstream and transforming the economy on the basis of them contributes, I think, our best chance, actually. And, and just in reply to the last question, I do see us as enormously creative, clever people. But I think what we've done what we're trying to do is curtail that creativity, funnel it narrowly into simple technological solutions to problems that are much, much more complex, that call on us to question ourselves, to question who we are, to be creative in relation to our vision for the future, and not just in our clever technological capability to produce yet more widgets. Okay, Daniel, um, can I just ask you to address the point that was raised about inequality. Surely the focus we have on growth means that we do end up living in an unequal world and unequal societies, and that's really not something we want, is it? Yeah, well, one of the uh, chapters in my book looks at this discussion of inequality. And, I mean, I think temperamentally and politically, I, I, I am an egalitarian. You know, I do think equality is a, a, a good thing, generally. Uh, but, and the important caveat is that I'm completely against the argument about inequality being used as an argument against growth. So I'm really hostile to green egalitarianism, which is very popular at the moment, which says that uh, it really pushes the idea about inequality, but what it's really saying is that it wants equality of sacrifice. It wants us all to, uh, to have less, to consume less, to rein in our ambitions. So I'm really, really hostile to that. And in that context, it is really important. You should remember that Tim's book, I think it's completely fair to call it a semi-official report. It is based on a report for the government's Sustainable Development Commission. And it's very much in line with the trend at the moment, the official trend towards austerity, which is talking down people's expectations. So the government is not saying, yeah, yeah, we love cuts, let's cut people's living standards. It's very much promoting the idea, or that the, the new government has abolished the Sustainable Development Commission, which is really excellent, one of the few good <laughs> things it's done. But the, 
that the main trend is still to say, no, don't worry about prosperity, worry about happiness, worry about inequality. We've only got one planet anyway, so you have to rein in your ambitions. So that is the form. If you want to talk about cuts and austerity, that is the form that it's going to take. And if we're going to resist austerity, then we have to really tackle the kind of arguments that Tim's putting forward. So I'm in favour of uh, prosperity, but I want everyone in Britain to be as rich as people in the city of London. Say, I don't want everyone to be as rich as, or as poor as people living in Blackburn or you know, the inner city Glasgow or something like that. So yeah, let's have equality, but by moving up, not by having uh, e green egalitarianism and everyone sacrificing. Okay, we don't have a large amount of time, so I just want to give Tim a quick chance specifically to come back on the idea, are you um, justifying government cuts? If you want to, if you don't want Absolutely to, that's fine. Not. Absolutely not. Actually, if you look at the direction this government is going in relation to investment, in relation to public goods, in relation to social quality of life, it is deeply, deeply worrying. It's going against all of the arguments that I was putting forth in Prosperity Without Growth, which point to the absolute necessity to invest in social conditions, to invest in resource productivity, to invest in public goods, to invest in the ability of people to flourish. And actually these cuts are a dreadful place to be and nothing at all to do with the message that I am talking about. Let me just distinguish uh, though because like Daniel keeps eliding these two things. I'm not against prosperity. I'm arguing for prosperity. It just isn't the same thing as economic growth. Okay, if you hold that forth a moment, I'm going to go out to questions on the floor and then come back in. I want to pick up on this point about the public social level because it's really struck me that so far in all the interventions, human nature has been characterised as if it were hardwired at the individual level. And of course, Daniel and Tim disagree about the, the, the character of human nature at that level. What happens when we start learning lessons also from anthropology which shows how our ideas of human nature are conditioned at the social level? And then we have to look at the nature of our society to help understand the nature of our ideas of human nature. And it isn't controversial to point out that we are bombarded continually by very powerful interests with a particular notion of what it is to be human, to acquire, to consume. I mean, it's not a partisan point. This, this is, in fact, there is the, the, the forces arrayed, the investments taking place on the one side rather than the other are massively disparate. And it, when one sees that, I think the Cinderella nature that Tim is pointing up gets reinforced. It's clearer why it is that that notion of human nature is systematically sidelined, and I think it has some real relevance. Okay. You can't carry much in a, in a Ferrari. There are limits to how much I can carry much in my Jaguar. But uh, infinite growth is impossible. The planet is finite. There's not enough land, water, fossil fuels or minerals for the current population, and your figures don't add up. And I've got shares in oil and mining companies and they're struggling, but they are looking in the third world to find more, and if that gets recycled locally, fair enough. We, have, we are overcrowded in Britain. The third world countries are fighting over land, and there are more polite disputes over, over water rights in the Murray-Darling and the Colorado rivers, highly civilised countries struggling. I may have no children and want to work forever, but I'm not going to be a stay-at-home vegetarian paying taxes to put yet more people why not we, are we not cutting our numbers and putting our marvellous uh, intellectual expertise into working out a way of politely getting our numbers down? My point was really a, uh, to pick up on a point that Tim mentioned earlier. Your premise in all of this was, if I'm right in understanding, was about rediscovering what it is to be human. And you also said that it was incredibly important to have hope. And I would agree, it's absolutely important to have hope. But uh, unfortunately, your definition of hope doesn't seem very hopeful to me. It doesn't inspire me at all. And I think it's probably true to say that most people in the world would uh, disagree with your definition of what it means to be human. I think that the, the discussion about um, limits to growth, it assumes that the kind of stuff that we want is more of the same. Really, it's not simply about more stuff. It's about more and better stuff. And the point is that when, you, when you're looking at qualitative improvements in the kind of um, things that technology can bring, then you are talking about more gadgets, which as, as you've got economic growth and uh, development in techniques, you've got miniaturization, you've got less materials being used in the end product. However, 
that does mean that there's more materials used in the production process and more energy required to make those small objects. And that's fine, right? We want more and better stuff. But in order to achieve that, I do, uh, something that hasn't been touched on by the panel, I mean, I, I'm kind of old-fashioned. I'm, I'm a red, and I do see the market as a bit of a barrier to being able to achieve the forms of organization necessary to achieve that kind of growth. What do the panel think on that? Trickle-down has failed, consistently failed, to deliver what it was supposed to deliver. On the question, so, I mean, I'm with you on that markets won't deliver this. It won't deliver it for us. It won't deliver it for um, the poorest countries in the world. On the question of human nature, I think this is, is, is a key point. Um, we can all argue about what human nature is, but it is useful sometimes to go to people who've done some work and who've looked at it and who've thought about how human nature evolved. They've measured how it plays out in people's values and attitudes across the world. And there the message is very simple. Of course we love Ferraris. Of course there's a part of the human psyche that is selfish, materialistic, pleasure-seeking consumerism. Of course that is there in our nature. But all of those psychological theories tell us that that is always in attention. It's an attention between selfish and other regarding behavior. It's a tension between novelty-seeking hedonism and tradition and conservation. And these tensions emerged in our nature precisely because they were evolutionary. And yet what we've done systematically in this economy, as Andrew pointed out, is we've privileged and encouraged one narrow part of what it means to be human, the bit that makes the consumer machine work. Why have we done that? We've done it because those are the kinds of people we need to keep this system going. Why do we want to do that? Because we haven't yet figured out how to make an economy work without growth. That is our single biggest task. Forget whether we're doing it for good reasons or bad reasons, let's just concentrate, keep in our hearts and minds the poverty of Africa, the quality of the human spirit, and the task, the huge intellectual task of delivering economics fit for purpose. Okay. Um, do you have any points you want to come back on before you're summing up, Daniel? Yeah, well, uh, very quickly, I want to clear up three misconceptions. Uh, one, I think it's absolutely misleading to, to Tim to suggest that his view is a non-mainstream view. So, I don't, of course, it is true that we are bombarded by companies telling us to buy their particular goods. But the mainstream view since the 1970s is very much Tim's view that we're damaging the, damaging the environment, there are these environmental limits, we need to keep things sustainable, we need to be concerned about happiness, we're too greedy. Now, you, you're completely free to agree or disagree with those views. But I would say if you go through the official discussion, government discussions and... Uh, international organization discussions, that is the mainstream view. The view Tim is putting forward is the mainstream view. You can agree with it, or disagree with it, it is the mainstream view. I do not argue for infinite growth. I say Ferraris for all, not two Ferraris for all, or three Ferraris for all. <laughs> what, what I argue is that we should uh, have growth until we abolish scarcity, until we, we're all wealthy in our eyes. And it's, up to, it's not up to me to define exactly where that level is. But, you know, that's, abolishing scarcity really is the goal, which means making everyone very affluent. And also, I'm, I don't believe in consumerism. I don't support consumerism. I support raising living standards. So, if people want to have a flat screen TV, that is absolutely fine by me. But I don't say people should define their lives and meaning in terms of that flat screen TV. And in fact, it's Tim who's obsessed with consumption. I mean, Tim thinks we should consume less. But if you read the book, he sees human beings fundamentally as consumers, and his research is all about values, sustainable consumption, all the rest of it. I see human beings not ju just as consumers, of course we do consume and that's fine, but we're also producers. We can shape nature, we can control nature, we can produce more, and that's the rounded way to see human beings and to understand human nature. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's absolutely amazing to me to come here and find that I'm speaking for the mainstream. That wasn't my impression late on a Friday night uh, back in April 2009 when I was walking home having done, I thought, all the press releases and publicity material uh, in relation to a report, as it was then, called Prosperity Without Growth, which was, as Daniel says, put out by the Sustainable Development Commission and I received a, a phone call, 
Um, and all I can say is that this person on the other end of the, an unnamed official from an unnamed department, telling me in no uncertain terms that number 10 in an unnamed street in London um, <laughs> had gone ballistic. And um, actually that sense of, of being completely and utterly against a mainstream has haunted much of the debate around growth, I think. And in some sense, to cast growth scepticism as the mainstream is certainly against my personal experience of having even tried to ask the question when we first said we were gonna think about this issue. A treasury spokesman got up and said, now I see what sustainability is all about. It's about going back to live in caves. But that isn't in any sense, anywhere near the center of the arguments. The center of the arguments is, do we really have any model in human nature for a system that grows and grows and grows indefinitely? And the only thing you can think of is the systems that destroy the organisms that they build on, cancers. And these, there is no other model. There is no other model in nature for what we're trying to create our economies like. And the way that we've created these economies is beginning to undermine the quality of our natural environment. It's beginning to do no justice at all to what it means to be human beings. It calls on us to engage with this task in a really open and meaningful way, to get beyond simple differences of opinion between Daniel and myself and to ask what is the real challenge of an economic transformation that would deliver us a meaningful prosperity. And that is a task, I think, where we should take no prisoners. We should leave no question unasked. We should engage with all our efforts because it is, in fact, in that task, not any specific vision of what society is going to look like, but in that task itself that hope resides. Prosperity Thank is about hope. Tim gave the game away a bit when he talked about there's no model in nature for this and that. I mean, the whole point is that human beings are special. Human beings have capabilities that no other creature has. Human beings can shape the world, shape nature, uh, and transform it. Uh, so yeah, there's no model in nature because we're humans and we're special. The argument that his, uh, his arguments in broad terms anyway are not mainstream is just, just really unbelievable. I mean, even just look at the, look, if you go to the book and look at the endorsements in the book, they're pretty impressive. Uh, there was a very similar report uh, uh, produced by or sponsored by the president of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, uh, where they obviously had a bigger budget, so they had all these Nobel Prize winners uh, arguing a similar case, probably less articulately than Tim, as it happens. But these, you know, the, the idea of sustainability became mainstream in the 1980s. The UN endorsed it in the 1980s. The whole discussion of climate change is not really about climate at the moment. It's much more about how we need to limit our resources, uh, limit, you know, limit our uh, ambitions in order to save the planet. I could give lots and lots more examples or examples in my book. You systematically go through mainstream government reports, IMF reports, academic thinking. The whole idea of limits and redefining prosperity in the way Tim talks about it, is completely mainstream. And, and, whether, and whether Tim likes it or not, these ideas are absolutely essential to challenge if we want to challenge austerity. Because we are not going to be able to campaign against austerity. We're not going to be able to fight austerity as long as prosperity in the proper material sense of the, the word is so stigmatized. If we really, really believe that economic growth and prosperity makes us miserable, destroys the planet, makes us greedy, we cannot resist austerity. We really need to start challenging these ideas if everyone is going to be, have, be able to have a truly prosperous life. Okay, can we thank our panel?